All right. And thanks to all of you for coming and uh, not waiting at the bar for the bus to SeaWorld and listening to us instead. I really appreciate that on Wednesday afternoon. Oh, is the bar open? Good question. All right. <clears throat> and I think they, they keep it closed. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I started out in the nuclear Navy, came straight out of that into oil and gas. So I, I've been in operations, maintenance, uh, inspection, um, in downstream, eventually migrated into upstream. I was the sort of last man standing in the in the mid-90s when a bunch of the old guys and I put the reliability program together and then they all retired. So I kind of became the reliability guy for a while. And uh, at BP, I came into BP about nine, eight years ago after the Deepwater Horizon with some external experience to help put the maintenance program back together in the upstream. And I did that for the last seven years. And having worked at some other companies and, and worked in downstream, I had a bit of knowledge in this IT, IoT space and was asked to take this new role, which I've been in for about seven months. So a little bit about BP upstream. I'm in the operations part of the upstream. So we're operating facilities on land, uh, floating facilities all over the world. These are just a few pictures here. You know, the normal things that operators want to do. We want to operate safely, want to be efficient, want to be reliable. And these are where our assets are. We have about 8,000 people in, in the operations in the upstream, about 25,000 contractors, 47 operated assets, 15,000 kilometers of pipeline. So <clears throat> some of is BP operated, and some is through partners. Oops, so I'm going too fast here, sorry. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story, right? This is, this is how we came to be in this place. Um, after the Deepwater Horizon, BP needed to make a step change in process safety, right? Need to improve competitiveness. Um, the executive team recognized that it was hard for people to access information, and that was driving a lot of manumatic work, if you will, right? People going looking for stuff to make decisions, people not making good decisions because they couldn't get access to the information. You know, in my experience as an engineer, I would say I spent probably 70% of my time, 80% of my time looking for the information I needed and maybe 20% of the time actually doing the analysis, making the decision. We have a lot of data from a lot of disconnected um, resources, right? So the organization over time has compartmentalized. We started out on PCs, so you know the inspection guys wrote the inspection software for themselves on the PC and then and for their use case, I heard it several times through the presentations, you know, the data's for everybody now, that's I think the big change. So picture's worth a thousand words. Everything's related and nothing is critical. So this is my whiteboard sketch as I started in this role of trying to figure out, you know, how do I connect all this information together? And you know, it's a rough sketch and I've kind of grouped things into parts, but you don't have to try to interpret it. But I put all the systems on there and I put all the pieces on there, you know, if I think about the life cycle of equipment, we start out with uh, an engineering project, we design something, we build it, we gather all this information, we do the safety studies, the HAZOP and LOPA, we put the maintenance program, the inspection program together, and then we go into the plan, do, check, act circle. We, we expect people to take actions, we have operators take rounds, um, maintenance people inspect and repair, inspectors inspect fixed equipment, and operators operate the equipment. We gather all that information up, we put the real-time data with it, we put the financial data with it, we try to make decisions, try to decide if we need to do something, and then we just keep going around that circle through the life of the equipment. And so often you find things, like I had an incident because I changed the interval on servicing my PSV, but don't recognize that I invalidated my HAZOP or my LOPA until five years later when I do the revalidation. So these are the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve. And it's hard, right? So our journey really started in 2014. We started putting up a data lake. We, we worked with a, with a small startup company coming out of the Deepwater Horizon that was in the fraud protection area. 
And they saved BP a lot of money on the claims, on false claims coming out of Deepwater Horizon. And our CEO was so impressed with that that he actually asked that company to, what else could you do for us? And he signed an exclusive agreement with them, and we've been working with them pretty regularly. But they worked in the cloud with big data. So we had to set up a data lake. So we, we put a dedicated team on this, you know, with the CEO's backing, and we went after setting up a data lake. And we started to find other use cases and other things to go work on. And by 2016, some of our partners came to us and said, you seem to be a little bit further along than others in this big data data lake, and we'd like to collaborate with you on another project. So we went into a big project with one of our big suppliers on co-collaborating on building a software, and we call that Plant Operations Advisor. And there have been some press releases on that if you want to see who we're working with or anything. But as we got into that, the first part of it was co-developing co the software, and that was taken, we thought that might, they expected it to take about a year, and it's about, we're about two and a half years into it, and we're starting to realize the initial goals that we set out. So that's the software part of the story. But as I started to load the data for that and start to put the data in a format that I could send to the cloud and then send to their cloud and then we could process, it took five engineers about six months to sift through P&IDs, look at data, and bring all that into the data model that I needed to send into the cloud. And I went to one of my other partners, my historian partner, and I said, this is never gonna work. As soon as the software is done, everybody's gonna be looking at me and saying, okay, when are you gonna have your data ready? And at the pace I'm going right now for 47 assets, at six months an asset with five engineers, you can do the math on that. That's a big number and a long time. So I said, I need to do something differently. So our partner referred us to another startup and said, these guys are really good at doing this. And we began working with them and we took the same data set that we'd done on the first asset, which was our, our pilot with the software. We gave them the same data. It took three or four weeks to organize the getting to know you, getting the data, how do we get our data to you and all that. And then about Five weeks later, they came back with the, here's your data model. It was exactly the one that our engineers took five, five or six months to put together. So that kind of turned the light on for us of, you know, we can have a big federal enterprise structure. We don't have to go change the core data, but we can put all this data together and then build on top of that. So now at the point where we're starting to globally deploy the software, we put it in three regions and we'll put it in three more this year. I'm already two regions ahead of them preparing the data and ready to go. And then having done it for that project, I've also found you know, I can go straight into asset frameworks and, and start to build template things and push things out because now I've cleaned up all the data, it's in the right format. And you know, the, the digital tools made that work. So, the first asset, it was seven, it's about 17,000 tags per asset. So we, at this point, processed a couple hundred thousand tags. And we've been working on this. We've been working you know, at pace for about a year. So we have 60% 60, 60 of that's complete. It's taken four to six weeks. We're using, we're using one engineer, right? More than a million time series data streaming into the cloud. There's 6,000 other data sources at BP that we're going to eventually start to connect in. You know, the, the CMMS, the spreadsheets, the HAZOP information, all that. 30 million data connections. Um, that, uh, what, 10, 100 billion nodes? Mostly time series, right? And we're aligning the internal data sources to a common structure. And we, we started with the structure we use in capital projects. The other kind of things that have come out of this more recently, before I, after I prepared this presentation and got it through the legal approval and all that, is that there's a couple more projects that have come behind. We're doing some machine learning projects and other things. And as we start to do that, we find that we've already got the data 
in order for that, and it's made it much, much easier. So as we start to look at other things, the work we've already done, we're, we're building on it, and it's allowing us to go faster and faster. And it's also caused us to look at misalignment between the way we thought about real-time data and the way we thought about the transactional data in the CMMS and other things. So those things together have really started to accelerate our journey and, and made it easier. And I think what we're trying to pivot to this year is the, we're trying to actually put the data in the hands of the engineers and let them build and own the data models. And we think we're, we're starting that pilot actually next week and I think we're gonna be able to, to hand that over class by class and build a single model. So prior to this, we were building a model for each, each use case. Now we're gonna build a model and have everybody use it. And if it's missing something, we'll just add the data in. So that's, that's our story. And I think that's the last slide. Uh, learnings, okay. We don't have to change the core system, right? You don't need to give up your current investment. It's already, you can use it, right? The modern architectures, the new tools, the microservices, and some of the other things you've seen over the last few days give you give you the ability to pull that data in. It's sort of like Google Flights, right? When you look at Google Flights, they're using that same old airline system that's operating on probably a virtualized mainframe somewhere from the 70s. But you know, when I stand at the airline counter and want to change my flight, it takes 45 minutes. But when I go on Google, it can give me all that information in about four, four tenths of a second. So value the connectivity over the features, right? When you're looking for systems, you want to look for, can I connect it to other things? What can I, because the, the data is not for that subject matter expert anymore. You're going to get more value out of sharing the data across. Build your useful data sets. I've stopped saying digital twins at work because our engineering information uh, contractor is actually telling everybody that digital twins are 3D models. And I'm trying to break the cycle of that. So I'm calling them useful data sets now the data set that anybody can access and get what they want. Um, expand the model for new use cases instead of building a model for every problem. Use that to contextualize the information. If you contextualize the information in the model, whatever you attach to it will come. Because one of the things we're struggling with in the 3D visualization space is you gotta go keep all that stuff connected to the 3D model if you wanna visualize it. That's not sustainable in in my budget, I don't know if it is in yours, but you have to find a way that when you connect to one thing, everything becomes connected. And then let the data owners be able to curate their own data. So, you know, we've got the engineers at the top who are the subject matter experts who know what the screen looks like, and we've got the IT guys at the bottom who know what the database looks like and what all the tables are, and we have very few people in the middle who can speak both languages. So this is really about Let's close that gap, you know, and then we can start to make all of our engineers data scientists and we can move faster in this big data space. All right, and that's me. Thank you. <laughs>